to the work you're doing. Thanks to you all for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Hawley. Uh, Senator Padilla, you're recognized for your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate uh, the participation of all the witnesses here today. Um, let me begin by uh, uplifting a dynamic of uh, uh, disparities. You know, there's been a lot of uh, talk in recent years, and not just relative to COVID, but because of the impacts of COVID, responses to COVID, uh, a lot of the pre-existing uh, inequities in our society have been uh, exacerbated, frankly. Uh, so although underserved communities in many ways experience disproportionately the harms from the COVID pandemic from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, and more, federal relief programs often fail to reach those uh, most in need. Uh, federal legislation enhanced unemployment insurance benefits, for example, and expanded eligibility amid the severe economic shock caused by the pandemic. However, during the first year of the pandemic, black and Latino applicants were less likely to receive unemployment insurance benefits than white applicants. We have the data that uh, tells us that. Uh, additionally, a UCLA report found that the first distribution of loans through the Paycheck Protection Program actually widened pre-pandemic racial inequalities by supporting far fewer jobs per resident in black and Latino neighborhoods than in white neighborhoods in California. I'd be shocked to think that it was an isolated dynamic to California alone. Uh, now, these disparities are certainly not new, as I mentioned, but the COVID-19 pandemic certainly exacerbated them. And it's particularly disconcerting that federal relief programs may have made disparities even worse. Uh, proud that the American Rescue Plan included language that helped put equity front and center as part of our recovery efforts. But we need to make sure that the, its implementation actually improves upon those underlying in inequities. So my first question is for Deputy Director Miller. How is the Biden administration using COVID relief efforts and other federal funding to address these underlying inequities? Thank you, Senator. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about these efforts. As I noted in my opening remarks, uh, the pandemic, uh, pandemic disproportionately harmed underserved communities uh, and too often relief didn't reach those intended. One of the early actions of the administration was making adjustments to the PPP program for the items that you noted that were widely and publicly reported in terms of access to PPP loans for some of the smallest and disadvantaged businesses at a time where black owned businesses were closing at twice the rate of uh, other types of businesses, making sure that they had access to PPP. Another thing that we have done with regards to implementation of ARP is on the front end of programs, bringing together, as I noted, the gold standard meetings with agency IGs, the PRAC, OMB, the ARP implementation team and agencies so that we're taking steps in program design, ensuring that both relief is targeted where intended and that we're putting in place reporting mechanisms that are, get the right balance between ensuring that we're getting the outcomes that we need while reducing burden for applicants. No, definitely acknowledge the progress that's been made on uh, thinking about this on the front end and I certainly hope that it becomes uh, institutionalized and baked into efforts going forward across the board. Uh, next question is for Chair Horowitz. Uh, just like to ask what recommendations you may have for how the federal government can better ensure that underserved populations are prioritized for funding and resources. Yeah, Senator, thank you for the question. One of the challenges we found again is the data gaps here. Um, what we've seen is, is we've looked to see how have underserved communities been uh, advantaged by these programs or disadvantaged by these programs, we're finding there's a lack of data. We're not sure what um, the backgrounds are of those who've gotten the loans. We're not sure about the economic status of individuals who've applied. Um, and it's been one of the things we've reported on and we've actually held hearings on about some of the challenges in us even trying to figure out how that came about. So I think one of the first things is agencies making sure they, they get data. Um, another is what GAO found in a report they did about PPP and the second, uh, uh, the, the furtherance of the PPP program um, by ensuring that community development financial institutions were available to distribute loans. That was an important step forward. 
very important GAO report in that regard. Um, also, with regard to how programs were run, operated, and money was distributed, what we found is those who didn't have internet service, those who didn't have the ability to apply through the process set up, couldn't get it. And that harms mostly those in rural communities and in underserved communities generally because of broadband issues. Right. No, and that's a, a classic example where it might have been well-intentioned, not completely thought through, uh, uh, efficiencies to be gained by being primarily digital, but without recognition of, yes, the digital divide is still alive and well in America. Uh, we are only worsening those pre-existing uh, gaps and inequities. Can, can I add one other, which is Please. the fraud we've talked about? It not only victimizes the program, but particularly for several of these programs, it victimizes those who were, they were intended for, which often are those most in need. Right. And what we've heard, we actually had a meeting about this just the last couple of weeks on the identity fraud, identity theft issue. We heard from representatives of underserved communities about how what happens is after uh, when people in underserved communities seek to apply for those benefits that they're the ones legitimately entitled to, but their identities have been stolen, it turns out they're the ones being questioned as if they're the fraudsters. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that struggle to get their identities back. And so that's actually a very big issue. When, you, when we talk about identity theft, we yeah. think about um, how the programs have been defrauded, but they harm the people whose identities were stolen. And I'd love to follow up with you on what we're doing after the fact to assist those who have been victims of identity theft, as opposed to, sorry, we're going to make this hard for you, uh, and we leave them on their own to, uh, uh, to figure it out. Uh, I know my time is limited. I do want to uh, put one more issue on the table here, and that is the use of facial recognition, uh, and more specific to how it's been uh, brought up earlier in the hearing. As we continue to combat fraud, to your point, in federal programs, it's important that our efforts to provide program integrity do not come at the cost of privacy and accuracy. I recently joined Senator Menendez and other colleagues in sending a letter to the IRS highlighting well-documented concerns about the use of facial recognition technology, especially for individuals who have poor internet service at home, uh, who rely on computers in public libraries, for example, or who use older phones, uh, or for whom English is not their first language. I'm pleased that the IRS has taken initial steps to transition away from the use of facial recognition technology to verify uh, identity. Uh, however, given the gravity of the threat to civil rights and civil liberties by this technology, especially against immigrants and people of color, other vulnerable communities, uh, I remain concerned about the continued use of this technology and the vast amount of biometric data that agencies and contractors are managing. Question for Comptroller Dodaro. How do you think agencies can best uphold the integrity of the programs without undermining the civil rights and civil liberties of program beneficiaries? Well, they have to make sure that they first address those issues. They recognize what those issues are and properly address it. Uh, they need to go through uh, the due process of hearing from different people. But you have to understand the technologies. In facial recognition, a lot of agencies are using it now, mostly in the law enforcement communities. Uh, we've made several recommendations about this. And some of the technologies have built-in limitations in them. So you have to understand the limitations in the technology, people, particularly for people of color. Uh, for facial recognition technologies and others. So there are ways to do it, but it has to be a very thorough, deliberative, careful process to make sure that it's only used with proper understanding of not impinging on people's civil liberties. Yeah, look, we obviously have a lot to follow up on there uh, in a deeper dive on specifics. I would argue just because it is in more widespread use among other departments, other agencies, other sectors, not just the federal government, doesn't mean it is not problematic in those areas as well. So it's not pointing to, well, it's being used in law enforcement right. as to uh, a reason to forge ahead without the uh, uh, thoughtfulness required. I understand, required. That, and that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that even in law enforcement, it needs to be careful. We've made recommendations on making sure people understand the information that they're getting. But if you go outside that area, you need to have due care. So we're, we're in agreement on that. Right. Can I just add one thing on that? Because there has been a lot, and there is a lot to be concerned about here. 
but it can't also paralyze us and agencies from taking steps to prevent identity fraud and identity theft. And um, there has to be that kept in mind. There's oftentimes this, we can't use this tool, so we'll stop trying. And, and I just encourage, because it has such wide ramifications, the identity theft. We've seen it endemic in these programs over the last two years, and it's hurting those who the money should go to. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Mr. Senator Padilla. Senator Scott, 